over that the bags that we give out, the bags are actually, I think the bags we use, the current camera, the bags are endemic. They are endemic because they are peculiar to some group of uh, people. But as I announced before, when I went around city, I think by the end of today, or very early tomorrow, we will be able to be so many that will do run to everybody. And so many that will be pandemic, the body process of virus. <laughs> Epidemic. That means it's peculiar. It affects large number of people. That's the reason. I don't know what the number can be, but I think the number comes to mind. If you do with the last three cases reported in the United States, but to make sure that this is reported to us, that case it is epidemic. I think before COVID 19, before HIV, we actually have inequality pandemic worldwide. And I think that's the point when we raise them away. Any political pandemic in which the few rich people are getting richer, while the majority of people are getting poorer worldwide. And that one has a cure. The cure is to allow for fair distribution of resources. Or even as we talk of income inequality worldwide, I want to also add in, let me have this idea that income inequality it seems to be more endemic because it is part of the world. It's no more pandemic, but it's actually endemic. And Oxfam released a report, which has been released about three, three years from now, that the combined weight of five Nigerians equal to $29.9 billion. And that this combined weight and we write the big poverty. Uh, the final assumption of the last conversation we made, that one is just about $60, it's about dollars So I think, as we are discussing about uh, COVID-19, and then it's quite significant, the most significant, but that are actual of life, and they are important as time is. Uh, because just everybody has agreed now that there is a lot of stuff. We need to lot of stuff. Massive evaluation, interest rates have gone up. You know, so I don't think we need to wait for the five years time. Post COVID, you can't have proper recovery unless you compensate working men and women who have so massive, you know, lots of income. Due to the lockdown and above all, a stable migratory economy policy. And I think serious economy. You know, those who are interested in development also agree that the best way to recover post COVID is for you to increase wages of work. You can see what has gone on in Europe and America, there have been conditional transfer of money. Then the last one, I think uh, Professor Pam said this very well, and I need to say you that one biggest advantage part of the lockdown and the loss of the supply chain. And honestly, you cannot recover. If you were to have caught it, you are poor. I'm very sure the level of poverty went down more because of this activity and all of that. And I think we must engage the government to say that we have to avoid this panic, this new round of panic, following this uh, Omicron. So who made it is to say that if you are the doctor, public service actually works. I'm giving you the service that if public service was running with the doctor, because they asked workers from level 12 to uh, level 1 to 12, I think those who do the theater. So who are about to say if the public service is uh, so we are So we don't need to record the global solidarity, not blame the, you know, an injury to one, it's an injury to all. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you, the community. I agree with you on the point for productivity improvement, but I will define you to the body, the body need for wage view at this moment. Yes, I we? And the reason is very simple. I understand the necessity of a wage review, but I'm troubled by the implementation of the one that has not been implemented. And there are also other macroeconomic equipment that can bring support to working people. There are several areas of intervention that is required at this material time. Social protection for the vulnerable is also part of the broad area of, of, of that. I agree, particularly for our colleagues in the private sector, is that wage review is a continuous process. And we are in the process of a labor law review that will make it mandatory also to have collective bargaining mechanisms in the public service. If you have that, we don't need to wait five years, ten years to, to have this kind of national festival uh, around wage review. So I think it's something that should take uh, that should take the pattern of what we do yearly, every few years, we have a constant review of wages rather than wait uh, for five years and six years and people are punished. You have uh, an enactment that is not respected by government. Yes, are we? 
and the reason is very simple. I understand the necessity of a waiting view, but I am troubled by the implementation of the one that has not been implemented. And there are also other macroeconomic engagement that can bring. The Kenyan population is about 50 million. We are about 50 million people. And about the 50 million, we have got 27 million women and 26 doubt men. So women are slightly more than men in Kenya. The total number of people vaccinated from COVID as of yesterday was 10 million people. 10 million Kenyans have been vaccinated. And then the, the death out of COVID since it started is about 6,000 people. We have lost 6,000 people COVID. As of yesterday, the positivity rate average for COVID-19 in Kenya is now 0.8%. So I think that gives you a, a, an overview of how the situation is. Then also it's important to understand that from our statistics, uh, the number of jobs we have lost since COVID struck is 3 million people. 3 million jobs. A total of 3 million jobs have been lost. Those are the jobs that we are able to ascertain from our statistics. Of course, there are others in the former economy that we cannot be able to tell. And just a breakdown on how the situation was. One of the biggest employers in Kenya has been the Chinese contractor, which is building the SDR uh, rail train uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi. They sacked about 4,500 workers who are Kenyans and 500 Chinese experts who are sent home for lack of jobs. Our national carrier, Kenya Airways, when COVID came in, it immediately sacked 4,000 employees. And majority of those that remained behind, they were put on a salary cut of up to 75%. You can imagine reducing your salary by 75 percent. You want how to pay your bills and even pay for your rent. Then, also the worst hit sector was the private security sector and also the private second schools and private schools. We have got over 1,930 private second schools and 8,000 private private schools. When COVID came in and the closed for a year, all these employees from these schools are sent home permanently. Because you know private school, they depend on the income they get from the parents to pay the teachers and the support staff. When these schools closed, all the workers were sent home. Then when it came to the security funds, because now most businesses were closed, people didn't require more security to hire. We have a total of more 2,000 security funds in Kenya. Out of those 2,000 security firms in Kenya, total employment in the sector about 1 million Kenyans. Out of those 1 million Kenyans, the people that were sent home from the security firms were almost 700,000 workers. They were sent home without an income. You must understand that from that end, the hotels that were closed down, they were one of the biggest hotels in Kenya, like the Intercontinental Inter 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 Hotel. Of course, the Fairmont, uh, Norfolk, and the Grand Legends Hotel. These hotels, like, for example, the Grand Legends, they are employed about almost 600 people. They just woke up in the morning, they get up, they got a notice on the, on the gate that the hotel has closed down definitely. So the somebody was allowed to get in. Even if you had left anything inside the hotel, you are not allowed to get in. It was the same case for Fairmont, Norfolk, that was employed about 400 people. And the same thing to Grand Legends Hotel and also the Moment Peak Hotel. They closed and told people we are not opening up to go home. Recently, also the same happened to the Russell Blue Hotel that we have up was almost 700. They closed, but with a the rider, they told people you can go home, we shall look at the situation. If it improves, we'll call you back to job. The self organization trading was called to Kenya sign an MOU with the rest of the social partners of the government and the Federation of Kenyan Employers that during this COVID situation, 
any worker that goes home will be guaranteed of coming back to the employment. But the same same employer has signed the agreement. They have now gone to court to contest it. They said this was a gentleman's agreement that we signed. We didn't know that COVID would take long. We thought COVID was about two months, three months, that is over. But since it has gone on up to now, so the employers have disowned that document, which means the fact of the app, the, app, the many, many thousands of workers that are at home is not now known. Because we wanted to base on that document, the MOU, so that we can argue out and have our workers back to employment. But we are fighting on, as we have said earlier from the other speakers, the fight is on, that's our work. When there is no crisis, then you have no one. When there is no justice, then you have no one. As trade unions, we have to keep on hoping for the best, keep on fighting, pushing. And that's our work, because that's what work has expected us to do, and we'll continue doing that. I think I'm doing my best. Thank you. Very precise presentation. Uh, which area of HR on the country called Kenya? Population, men and women, the level of vaccination, which I consider to be quite very high. If you relate that to what is happening in our country, the country of about 13, 15 million people, I mean over 10 million people vaccinated. I think that's that's a very positive information from from uh, Kenya. Job losses, same experiences in aviation, construction, hotels, uh, private schools. From the information that our colleague from Kenya gave you. Very great response from the unions, MOU, uh, with government and social partners, even though there are uh, still some issues, challenges and abuse of the But that the union was able to be proactive to engage social partners to have that kind of understanding was quite positive. In Nigeria as well, unfortunately, we couldn't have a trap attack, but we have a bank attack. MOU with the, with the employers in general. And I think that also helped to moderate uh, the kind of vicious job losses that we will have encountered in the manufacturing sector at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, Covering is very important, and I love the note on which he ended about the point that Barrister uh, Femme Bush and also raised that so long as industry persists, so long will the unions remain alive. I think it's on that note that uh, Adams also did this conclusion. So I will invite our brother from Syria to have a population of uh, 7 million people and uh, uh, which constitutes uh, 4 million women. Yes, uh, we had our first test case of COVID 19 in the 31st March 2020. And uh, at present now, we have uh, 6,405 uh, 6, cases, and uh, we have recorded 121 deaths. We continue learning, continue learning the COVID-19 issues. Every day we are having different things. We are having video discussion and measures. We are having a need. So uh, I'm encouraging all of us in our small groups. When we went back to our different places, let's continue in living our ourselves and let's continue to find solutions to the issues that are affecting us as, as the union leaders. And uh, uh, COVID-19 was well, all over the world. When I, when I was contacted to come here, I went to our airport. I was visited. Yes. They told me, except I paid such an amount of money, I will be charged for money. And I paid the money without even offering the test. Those issues are also the same in other countries. So it's very starting. I think I will need to do something in that regard as a trade union member. And uh, I know very well again. When I want to do the deal, the day I want to leave there, they are going to ask me again to do another test. <laughs> so, the world over is very difficult. Travel bans have been slammed on countries, not to enter in other countries, because of COVID. 
No, uh, for us in Sierra Leone, of course, we had a pandemic before, epidemic before, sorry, that is the Ebola epidemic, that erupted our economy, killed thousands of our compatriots, and uh, I, I, I know you guys heard about it. So it was very, very, very uh, disheartening. And for India as that, we are still we are still on the process of planning because we compare COVID-19 and that of Ebola, we have similarity, we have similarity the precautionary measures, the restrictions, and all the like. But yes, we are still continuing to learn about the COVID. So uh, without relating of what other people have said here, I want to say thank you for listening and we continue to engage ourselves and learn more on the issues that are, are disturbing us in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. 121, overseas thousand people infected, issues of social security uh, cover as part of issues and union and uh, on board. But emphasizing the need for social dialogue because the the COVID disease is taking on new forms, new dimensions, and so constantly there's a need for social dialogue to be able to respond adequately to whatever the new issues are emerging. I will call on Brother Tijani Kamara from that day. figure of our population and uh, the total cases we had what we have up to date is 9998 9998 the number of deaths 342 doses we had some problems problem of religion problem of culture a lot of people didn't want to take the dose because of religious beliefs I may not uh, have the time to dilate on that but I'm sure the the problem is all over Africa. A lot of people don't believe, just like you guys sometimes don't, in some regions in, uh, in Nigeria, regarding the polio, I know about that. So it's the same thing with uh, the vaccine also. So the total vaccine, some were compelled or forced or whatever, for, for lack of a better word, to take the uh, dose. They just took one and disappeared. They never took the other one. <laughs> okay, so those who took only one dose and didn't and refused to take the other one, that's 229,974. And those people like me who took the full dose is 226,370. 226,370. And 42% uh, of our population are vaccinated. 42. 42%. Forty yeah, of our population are fully vaccinated. Um, now, let me, for lack of time also, let me come straight to the pandemic as it relates to work. Uh, we are very weak. Excuse me for that, uh, for saying that, but I'm just saying it as it is. We are very weak in Gambia. We are very weak at communication. And uh, 
I'm sure you are not in the army, but I was one of those people called when we lamented that the communication was not right. When, when, when this thing happened, this uh, pandemic happened, we didn't know what it was. And I must tell you, before it was officially announced, and before God, uh, China even declared it, I had suffered something like that. All the symptoms that are said about uh, coronavirus, I, I, I experienced it sometime around August of 2020. So I don't know. When they explain that it's like this, it's like that, it's like that, I said, that is what actually happened to me. What then China didn't even say. But anyway, the ginger was good. The garlic was good and the cloves we have good. The correct column call it cloves. C L O V E S. That was a local treatment. That was what treated. Uh, so we had some problems. The communication wasn't right. These people, as usual, of the Africans, when we hear things in the West, we don't ref uh, we don't filter it, we don't look at it with an analytical eye and uh, try to, you know see the best out of it, but we just accept it as it is wrong. So that and that and a lot of things happen. Imagine a country as far as the Gambia, you do that within a short period without you notice. It was wrong. It was wrong. I may not want to tell you all the details in the other sectors, but perhaps in my own uh, area, the one that I serve as Secretary General, is the Gambia Association of Informal Workers. In fact, government did give up money. They gave up money to those who were working and some chicken change to those in the tourism and those in the beach and the like. Thank God, uh, I was the director of arts and culture in the National Council for Arts and Culture, and subsequently the chairman of the board of directors when I returned. So I still have my connections, my influence. A lot of people in Gambia didn't have that kind of support. You know, it was really low. How did the system change? In fact, government did not change it. Government was locked and they, they accepted the norm the global norm that was they were, they, all over the world they were closing they were doing this they were doing this Gambia also didn't sit down to do their homework they just closed but then what happened is it was a religious religious revolution that changed everything it was the imams who said they cannot uh, do it anymore they must must be open and they started praying without permission without you know ignoring all the laws and in fact where some of them had to fight with the security people. And when because what we understand was election was just around the corner. So they wouldn't want to you know have a problem with with with, with, with uh, that part of the population which are the imams. They have their pulpits to, to, to spread out whatever message and uh, sometimes they are feared in Gambia. The imams, the pastors, you understand. So government had no option but to, you know, allow allow us to open. Market women also had it. They opened, you understand. And that is how things changed because election was just around the corner. The day I left Gambia for this very uh, program was the day of our elections. Wow. See, when election is around the corner, a lot of things are, are, are ignored because it has political implications. You understand. That is the situation. What I'm trying to say here is government did not do their homework to close, but they opened when they didn't want to open. We had to, you know, do it our own way, the imams particularly, and the market women. So that is the situation in Gambia. And, up, and there is also what it has manifested, which is not new to us, is the corruption that I have seen. Corruption is everywhere, but the corruption I have seen since I uh, was born in the Gambia, for all these years that I lived, I have never seen this magnitude of corruption in Gambia. Monies were pumping, and we all were optimistic that this money that was given to us, definitely even after the COVID, you know, we can utilize it for other things. Within three months, the money disappeared. Even face much, you cannot get it in the clinics. And the minister stood at the parliament to say that the money has gone because it was stolen. Deliberately, it was stolen. That's the wrong, wrong word he used. And some of the officials are now building three story building. Nothing happened. You see, political, I don't know, political word, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. But this is our story. It's a long story and a very sympathetic, uh, and a very sad story for that matter. That uh, 
the way things happen here, so organized, is not happening with us. So we are still in that situation and are trying to get funds to help ourselves over there. I bring someone to prop on social contract theory. And you gave it a two model. Either to negotiate or to define a social. And I want to take the side of the negotiation. But my question is, is it applicable at the current level? Because you said this is at the level. Two. Is it possible to use that in collective bargaining, since it is still on the planning level? Then, to buy a family abolish, as we have with you for seeing you today, it is a very long time. Now, in Lagos, which is not very well, we are talking of BP place. If you move from my two notions, you will see Chinese companies, Lebanese, etc. They don't belong to the union. They will treat our Nigerians to the state of death. They will need to learn the idea. So, one of the days I went to my friend's place and I met three girls discussing how this school has been given in what we need to them. I intervened. I said, please, can I get involved? And the same day, I prepared for my friends in the Indonesia, my personal friends, and we went to the company. Well, they didn't give us attention, but we forced our way. But to my greatest surprise, when it was the time, because we are, I told them, we can't do this without two people. We will do the problem, carry the one another. Just say it was you that complained, and you want to belong to the union. So when it was time for them to come up, this is all of them disappeared. So it was a very big shift, but what do you use brother to do? I don't know how to make sure you don't have access. Now my question is, as a private individual, like a lot of this society, have I any right to go to companies that are black and precious is happening as a level person to intervene on behalf of my fellow society? Because this is not belong to the union. And I don't know, nobody looks at them. If that is here, how far can I go as a private person? Tony can also involve you in the law sector to help so that these people can be assisted. And does the law also permit me as a private citizen to do what I was doing in Lagos? All of a sudden, in fact, because of me, I don't know, those guys are not going to run away from the area. They are not a citizen again. But my wife was too much. Asking them, let's go, let's go. So that is just the So many people are being neglected. So many people are being cheated among Nigerian workers. Particularly in Lagos, I don't know what happens. Thank you. I'm going to get the address to the master of the department of the city sound. First of all, I want to make a comment on the issue of our desires to change the community. To go through the politics of what is about to have our own party. We have some people pretending to be government, and uh, that person was elected governor. But when he was doing it, he left seven months salary. Seven months salary. Do not allow any politician to hijack any party that we want to create. Because they will come as for government, but uh, they, when they get there, they know what they are going to do. That's the one. Number two, the issue of corruption associated with the money donated for this COVID-19. Is there no way the labor, the trade labor unions should intervene to ask questions? Some people made the money into their private pocket. They became uh, richer, whereas we are poor. So we need to look for something. Let us ask questions. Let the state government account for what they collected from the federal government. Let them account for what they collected from the overseas and supporters so that we will know where this money went to actually. This issue, we are just, we are just like my uh, uh, barista, uh, Fabian Fulcher, said, that the poor are becoming poor. 
We have a right to nation. For example, I want to use the, 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 the case of the state. The secretary of that committee was the son of the government. The secretary of the COVID 19 committee was the son of the government. So you see, that is uh, true. This is a minimum wage. As I'm talking to you, we, many of us in the state, have not started connecting as of today. This minimum wage. As of today, we don't connect it. has not been implemented for us. How can we go about it? Because those in the federal have to support the fight for them at the federal level. But we are the state. We are left to do our fighting in you. Thank you. My name is Commander Gabi. Um, I had expected that uh, one of our discussions, our panelists, the IRM will be there. But unfortunately, it's not here. However, I, I think probably we will finish the experience uh, Professor Pam has working with IRM. We may have uh, information regarding this. Uh, the most prevalent issue with, the, with uh, the COVID vaccine, be it AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, etc., has been that issue of vaccine appetite. One specific role is IRO, especially ACTRA, and ACTRA as the engaged in trying to address this issue. The statistics are there in America where over 75% have been vaccinated and in Africa less than 40%, whereas contrasting the population. Now, the second, second question is specific to Comrade Femi Aborigine. And we did it Monday to date the issue of uh, social protection and privileges in the, in the conversations regarding, regarding the COVID. Um, uh, and we are privileged to understand at this point that uh, there is an ongoing process for the review of the law. Now, the question is that issues around social protection are similar to what is extremely in, in the in the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as direct principles of state policy. And definitely not just stable human fundamental rights issues. If one what is the position of leader in terms of ensuring that social protection is included in the, in the, in the, in the review? And what extent can the review reflect fundamental rights rather than um, the representatives of the policy? I am from the Dolphins, Yusuf Benkart, of the Plato State Chairperson. I think the height of the especially a lecturer Professor Pam, we appreciate your effort in making us what we are today. I have two questions, sir. We have, um, and this is a line of education. Um, sir, we are all parents here, the children in our tertiary uh, institutions. And we have made it clear that there are issues pending issues, just like COVID-19 exposed those issues. And the issue of strike of our tertiary institution is a problem because it is my children and your children that are in that at the schools. And it is the children of the elite that are going to all these private universities. So my question is, what strategy do NLC take? Since we are all affiliates, of NLC. What strategy would uh, NLC take to see to the problem of incessant strike by our universities? Our children are at home. For us in Plato State, after the lockdown, they went back to school. After a few weeks, crisis started, they went back home. After a few weeks, they are all there with us. And I believe that uh, the union will not stop with us. We have to pass it to our children. So I want to see what the NLC will do so that we take other measures concerning our children's education institutions. Thank you. Then the second one, sir, about politics. We have also made it clear that labor, we must go into the political element too. 
and the people out there have lost hope in labor because they feel they are not really stood out for what affects them. So, what will the NLC start doing differently that will affect the people right so that they will believe in this our mission of venturing back into politics? Thank you. Professor Fola Shadisa, thank you. You have taught us today that we have, apart from the COVID 19 pandemic, we also have the Google Class pandemic. And it's a good thing that the voters here at the Labour actually tried to show their way to fight the ruling class when we saw the loss of jobs and all that, all that, the formalization of former jobs and all that, and the force of the total lockdown. But that there was one thing that was awkward, and that one thing was that they brought it more impact on the general or total strike. Considering now how insensitive the moment of the day in Nigeria is, you will see cases of Asusoyen or Strike or Lenos if they don't see all that. If you know, if the ball now impacts or declares a general strike, and this same insensitive government pays 10 years, what then should be done? We have been told that uh, this issue is too serious, it's a past issue, and we're not going to lament and continue to complain. Um, when we give the directive for action, and you carry out that action, the NLC has never, has never stopped to back the process of progressive behaviors. If you remember the strong hacking at after three days, the problems we had there, we came to take it to the source of the government. And the agreement is always stated there. No, no, nobody will testify to the result of this story. So please let us be assured that when you carry out an action that is directed by local Unions, state councils, or even your national union, the unions will back it up if you get into trouble. On the issue of labor and politics, I didn't quite get the question, but it's like you are saying, but, 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 okay, what the new effort in terms of dividing either the labor party okay. or the community or involvement in the political process? Okay. Well, um, you are quite aware of the problems we have in the best labor party. Uh, for, for, for most of you who are following the issues, we have set up the party to do that with TC in order to carry out struggles, that is, struggles that we cannot generally directly tackle, which would have been things that have been policies, you know. Mobilize the general guys, tackle issues of policies, if possible, and let our leaders, carry leaders into a uh, position of authority so that we will not overextend ourselves fighting corruption, uh, issues of corruption, issue of personal state government. But you can see what had happened that the 30 young leaders we had entrusted to lead the party, but that the votes. At the national and state levels, but at the national level, two trillion dollars. They decided to uh, they, 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 they try to screw the, 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 the party, screw it to not just behave as a crucial party, but using it as a party for the issue of negotiating for the elections. We now have we now have the business management and the relationship. Of, his, of, of the fact that the workers themselves don't even appreciate the party they have. They don't, they don't vote for that party, they don't even know whether that party exists. The leaders have been going about collecting money in order to run elections for people. 
And just so that they have a little bit we have decided, uh, like Jesus said, you know, uh, there's two issues. We have decided that we are going to take back our party. I bring it back to the people. And the uh, image is very serious about this because uh, from what you have seen going on, on, on so far, the PDP, the APC, uh, which is the two major parties we have seen so far that people power, they are all failures. And I think if we are in our right senses, if we are serious, we must try to take it. And that attitude was just comfortable among us. We are the ones that have raised to this country. If we are waiting for another party, we want to have the same problems. And therefore, next year, we are ready to take back this party. But I guess it's not taking back this party without you. So by the time we the time is starts to, 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 to just mobilize in your states as a government, we want to have your support. First and foremost, we are going to register two million workers as the members of your party. And if each of you here register as a member of that party, your families, your friends, the Labour Party is going to have less than 12 million registered voters. That we can assure you. And since the opportunity to also inform, I don't know, the government was speaking as if uh, there is despair. Um, and from the lectures we have seen so far, we have been told that uh, this issue is too serious, this is a past issue, and we are not going to lament and continue to complain. Um, when we give the directive for action, and you carry out that action, the NSC has never, has never stopped to back the process of the If you remember the struggle we had in the United States, after three days, the problems we had there, we came to take to the source of the government, and the agreement is always stated there. No, no, nobody will testimonize the result of this story. So please let us reassure you that when you carry out an action that is directed by local uh, unions, state councils, or even your national union, the unions will come. The comrade, from the doctors who raised the question about what other things they do as regards incessant strikes in our tertiary institutions. I think the question should be better put. What can we do? What can NLC do? What can all unions do? What can TUC do? What can we do as parents, as individuals? to support the workers in our tertiary institutions who are compelled to always go on the spot. Our agency should not be about our children who are not graduating as and when do. In actual fact, part of the problem in our educational system is that we are failing to learn that if you don't have a culture, a tradition to rebel, to disagree with the authority, you are an ignorant person. You are not educated. You may know how to read and write, but when you are not ready to recognize the rights of others being deprived him or her, and you are not prepared to say, I stand a long way those who are being denied their rights. Then there's a question mark the quality of our education in this country. There's a question mark. Because the question is, even if the children pass out, are they all going to take out of Nigeria to the employed? Would they not also remain in this system? Many of them are passed out, they are jobless. And the jobs are not there. And the jobs will not be there unless we learn to fight the ruling class and 
That is my job responsibility. In the universities in particular, since 2009 there has been an agreement which has not been observed by government till today. That agreement has been re-agreed, reviewed several times. The more they review, the more they observe it, in the breach. The same thing happened to the doctors. We defended the doctors in the court during their strike. And the doctors, you know, like I said before, said they were ready to go to jail. They don't miss it all. It was that determination the state saw that they could not do anything against them.
I know what we have been asking for. It's not just about salary, but it's about general conditions of the university system. We need our laboratories to work. We need you know, more things to be done in the university system. It's not just about salaries. And I guess unions here have quite a number of issues you know, with the government and the government has to deliver. So that's, that's, that's the thing. It's unfortunate that our children are in the educational institutions where we teach or where we work. But we need now to have a kind of push. You know, government is a look, enough is enough this. And our questions and comments have been responded to by um, with, uh, with Femi and uh, our country. But I like I like this question, I've not talked about it on uh, 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 copying and pasting chapter 2 of the Constitution to be part of chapter 4. It's very beautiful, I haven't talked about it. If you also recognize my many colleagues, who I also learned in that we are from the same international lawyers assisting workers. You see from the table we have uh, delegates from uh, Kenya, from uh, Gambia, and uh, from uh, Sierra Leone. We had uh, invited South Africa, but due to travel restrictions, Zimbabwe and uh, Zambia, they couldn't make it. But this is how uh, the footprint of the NLC Hamilton School is born. It's not only about Nigeria, NLC and the affiliates, but the impact of the far in, uh, in white. Then let me also speak to one of the issues that uh, was raised by Comrade Bello on the future relevance of trade unions and the need to like, revitalize or to renew. This is a topical discussion that we are having even in, at the level of the ILO actual because the world of work is evolving. There are new patterns of uh, employment and there are new forms of workers that we need to embrace into our lives. So I also want to congratulate the organizers of uh, the Hamilton School. I said a bit in some of the syndicate discussions and I see that most of the discussions are driving towards uh, trade union revitalization. One of the syndicates was discussing organizing trying to see how we can uh, reinvigorate our organizing strategies to be innovative, to leverage the technology so that we don't leave anyone behind in our organizing strategies. I also had the opportunity to attend the leadership uh, syndicates. They were talking about the whole issue of uh, transformational leadership. Leaders that are lead, lead from behind and that are also knowledgeable about the issues that are in Yesterday also I was part of the syndicate that was discussed in Kenya and they also see the need to start uh, renewing the NLC gender policy given the transformations that have uh, also taken place in the gender agenda. So my point is that this is a, a, a workplace, a marketplace for ideas. And uh, I think that uh, is it a research area, is it a human rights issue area, how do we go about it? So these are some of the issues that we are grappling with within the island, but I think the answer is in this room. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thanks so much. The answers are definitely this for me. All across the land, women are happy to be free. No longer in the shadows, for to stay behind, but side by side in true equality. So sing a song, sing a song. for women everywhere. Let
back to love and share And people want to bring an end to war So sing a song While we met everywhere And we bring around the world And never, never see So sing a song While we met everywhere are celebrating as women in the labor movement is the research that we did breaking the silence gender-based violence and we have won two cases in Lagos my 12th market in a very very special way uh, our dear comrade uh, Femi Aborishadi and the team of ILO helped us to make this and for free we didn't pay anything we have us working for the people and it's always their mother. And that is why we want in a very special way present him with this report which was launched at the opening of the 16 days of activism. Please, let's keep, uh, stand up, give him a round of applause as we... I give it to the General Secretary. What happens with Lager in the movement is that collectively we get for first time. So this award to abolition is a word to all governments who are committed to the cause of working people. Whether they are women or whether they are men, whether they are young, whether they are old. Is in that slide I will invite all the Christians to make this presentation. Uh, the yeah, the coming deputy general We say no, we say no, we say no, we say no. We say no. You have done business, you have been crowned, you've had awards. This is just our modest honor to you for the work that you have done. And this is coming from the women themselves. It's yes. very, very special. <laughs> so I want to meet you on this very like you said, I'm happy to award. Thank you, Commander Richard. Once again, I will say this. There are teachers in the room. 
and they will always insist that this boy would not have been able to spell his name if he was not taught by teachers. <laughs> I want to also want to say that these comrades, these women comrades, with all researchers, would not have been able to do field work. Neither would they know how to apply questionnaire if they have not been taught by our teachers. So we thank you for the continuous learning and experience that you continue to give to us, to empower us as a city, to empower us as an organization. We do not take it for granted. Many of us have been, we are beneficiaries of the great input that you have made in our schools over the years, of the critical intervention that you have done on sabbatica at the Nigerian Labour Conference, on the very many public lectures, including I recall the Guadalupe Foundation Lecture that you gave. Those are very beneficial, very impactful uh, input uh, that is coming from you. You will have chosen to do it with just one You are pretty close to them. But we know that your heart is here with the working people. And that's why you continue to make yourself available. Uh, each time we knock on your door. We thank you very sincerely. This research, like I said, it may not be the perfect piece of research. You should read. We brought us your email so that we can do better next time. We thank you for appreciation for the honor uh, in giving us in recognizing our little work which is actually a duty let me say that the activities of the women group have always constituted an inspiration and a basis for reiterating uh, uh, a covenant that for as long as I live, I'll continue to do my best to be in the working class, to stand by the working class, and fight along with the working class on the victory. Thank you. Thank you, always. I've been there for the Afghanistan Commonwealth I want to the capture the other have been so wonderful. She has made it possible. Uh, she came in and hit the ground immediately. If not, it would be almost impossible to have a conference from the other African countries to be here. And I'm happy that we have a comrade, Marasa Kotu. Now, country is part of the Quadratara. The Quadratara is an association of Nigerian Labour Congress, the South, South Africa, GTC Ghana, and the Kotu Kenya. And uh, when the other spoke, of course, he spoke like a diplomat about the discrimination on the distribution of the COVID vaccination. We will be able to work together to engage the heart for we need to have a national forum. And that's why it was a very critical approach to push to have our people to come here. And to it's a clear program from the NLC to push across this across Africa to build a strong Africa. Because what we used to have in the past is only European and American centers trying to give training to other Africans. And you know when they do that, they will control your thoughts. So it's a conscious thing. Like uh, when Pam was talking, he said that part of the way to deal with the issue of relevance is what we are doing here. Including from the point of law, from the point of organizing and the point of international. That is why we are here. 
regard the workplace is a good one and in our group we've been able to identify the challenge of COVID-19 to workers both former and informal sector economy as a whole we've been able to identify the areas where the union can be able to defend the workers as regard this COVID-19 so the program so far has been able to give us a foundation to which if we return back to our various union we'll be able to stand firm to also encourage our people to go for the vaccine and also follow the protocols as regards the COVID-19. 
the plenary session. What is your thought about it? Okay, I think uh, the plenary section has also we've been able to dive into some issues, like as the lecturers has uh, presented the issue of uh, revisiting our uh, social contract with our respective organizations. I think when we leave here, we will look into that. Secondly, we also discover we also have discussed the issue of uh, of um, redundancy caused by COVID-19. Uh, the unions will go home to look at. Why will our workers be dropped when they are not adequately compensated? COVID-19 shouldn't be a yardstick for uh, companies, either government or private sector, to drop their, pers their staff. They should be able to see to the need of providing the essential commodities or the essential material for the workers. So if they are dropping workers, that should be measured to which they should drop workers. Don't just drop workers outrightly because of COVID-19. The plenary session of today was basically to address issues around COVID and also um, economic crisis. How these two broad uh, challenges have affected workers and have affected the pattern of work and also how they have affected you know, the trade union movements. And I think the discussions were very clear that COVID has affected workers, has affected the trade unions, and it has affected, I mean, has introduced new sets of, of work which um, have really created problems, you know, for the way work has been organized, you know, in the country. Um, the economic crisis as well have affected us in the previous years and um, the workers you know, are worse for it. But the major point that was also made was around the, the, the argument that um, in the past the economic crisis you know, was there and COVID only exacerbated it. It made it uh, bigger and worse for the country, worse for workers and worse for the trade unions. Um, so that's, that's what basically the, we, we ended up on. And I think that the Hamatan School is an important um, arrangement uh, by the Nigerian Labour Congress to ensure that workers around the country and workers from other African countries congregate to have discussions around issues which affect their nations and also which affect them as workers and as trade unions. And I think the arrangement is good. Uh, there is a need, you know, for increased participation. Uh, there is a need, you know, for um, for us to fund it and to ensure that you know it is done in a way that would we'll see results, you know, very soon. So this is what I think, and uh, I hope that um, um, we would all walk a walk from here, you know, seeing results from our colleagues that have attended the workshop. We have been collaborating as an office with the NLC for a long time and part of our collaboration is around uh, organizing these uh, uh, schools of the NLC. It's my first time uh, to participate as an ILO official in the NLC school. So I'm, I must say the design of the school in terms of uh, preparation, mobilization of uh, participants has been uh, excellent because uh, this is um, the 17th edition of the school after not having the Hamilton school in 2019 because of COVID. So I t see the turnout by the affiliates to be very, very encouraging. They were all hungry for education, all hungry for networking. Then the design of the school is also very, very relevant for learning, especially trade union education and adult learning for that matter. Uh, the opening session was very, very high level, showing that uh, NLC is working with a lot of partners. The political structure of uh, Kwara State, we also had the DG of the institute, partners like FES, the Solidarity Center, including the landmark speeches by the president of uh, the NLC. So this is something that I saw very well uh, organized about the, the Hamilton School. Then looking at the plenary session, we are in the context of COVID. 
and most of the discussions, technical discussions were around the impact of COVID on the world of work, but not only looking at the impact, what is the role of trade unions? And I saw that uh, the participants were very responsive and they were actually demonstrating that while COVID was a challenge, there were so many opportunities that they are seeing beyond COVID. And one of the opportunities is to intensify trade union education and training using online modalities where this is uh, possible. In terms of uh, the breakaway sessions where participants went to thematic sessions like uh, leadership, gender, organizing, I followed three of the breakaway sessions. The commitment of the participants in the work that they are doing, interrogating the topics and the outcome of their discussions shows that um, we are investing in the leaders of tomorrow. In his opening remarks, uh, brother Ayuba actually mentioned that he is now the president of the NLC, but he was once a scholar in the Hamilton School. So in terms of sustainability, we see these schools going a long way. Because uh, what I believe is um, the participants that came were deployed by their organizations with a mandate to ensure that the learnings from the school are also cascaded to the workplaces so that we reach uh, many more members. On the impact on um, Nigeria at large, we were listening a lot to evidence-based research that has been conducted by professors, by academia. And this is the information that NLC requires when it engages uh, government employers on areas of uh, labor market governance. They have uh, well-researched documents and positions. So this can also change the sustainable development uh, outlook of uh, of Nigeria. So as ILO, we are committed to the outcomes and uh, going forward in the year 2022, we are also looking at how we can support the outcomes from this um, uh, uh, Hamilton School. I am very, very uh, excited and elated uh, to be part of uh, the, the school organized by the NLC and it has shown that the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic are not peculiar to Nigeria. They are indeed international. Uh, there, are inter I mean, uh, there are international uh, participants at this program uh, who came from Sierra Leone, the Gambia, and Kenya. And what they have related they have all shown to us that the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic are not peculiar to Nigeria. Uh, workers internationally have suffered enormously in terms of job losses, non-payment of wages, uh, and the weaknesses in the healthcare systems in our various uh, uh, countries have also been exposed. The participants have, however, recognized that we are to fight not only the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic, we are also to fight the ruling class pandemic. The nature of the class struggle between government and workers, between trade unions and government, if the workers organize formidably and they make their demands and back up their demands with action, government is bound to respond.